Hello there, CSEC physics students. Welcome back to another video. And in this particular video, we will be going through this 2012 specimen paper one that CXC provided us with, okay? So this is, a, this is supposed to help you with your preparation for your paper one CSEC physics exam. And so the paper one is typically 75 minutes long and there are 60 items on it you'll have 75 minutes to answer all 60 of them. So that gives you about a minute and some change to work on each question, okay? So let's jump right into it. So again, this is a specimen paper from CXC from 2012, okay? So let's go down to the first question, which is asking us about vector quantities. Which of the following is a vector quantity? So immediately we're thinking, okay, what's a vector again? A vector quantity, it has both magnitude, right? And it has direction, right? So it has both of those things associated with it, magnitude and direction. So mass is only a magnitude, only has magnitude. Density is only magnitude as well. Moment is also only magnitude. Whereas momentum, we know, is the product of mass times velocity. And we know that velocity is a vector quantity, right? So since momentum is derived from this vector quantity or has this vector quantity involved in it, then momentum is going to also be a vector quantity. So we select D for answer here, right? Let me use a different color to circle my answer. So D, momentum, is a vector quantity while all the other ones are not. They're only scalars, meaning they only have a magnitude associated with them, but no direction, okay? So let's circle D for our answer here, all right? So D is our answer for question one. So moving on to question two now. Question two says, which arrangement gives the greatest resultant force acting on the block, right? So whenever we see these kind of vector diagrams and we're asked to determine what the resultant force is, what we're gonna do, let's pick the right. So the arrow's going to the right as a positive direction, right? So let's say this is positive 15 Newtons. And then the things that are going to the left, the arrows to the left, we take that as negative, right? So that would be minus two Newtons. So the resultant is just the net force. So when I do my 15, that's going in a positive direction, and I minus 2 from that, I'm going to end up with 30 newtons. So that's my resultant force acting on this block. And remember, we're looking for the, the one, the arrangement that would give us the greatest resultant force, right? So in the first case, I'm going to get a net resultant force of 30 newtons acting on the block. In the second case, remember, we take this side as positive and this one has negative. So when I add these two together, I'm gonna to come up with what? Zero Newton. So there's no resultant force acting on this. Um, and then in this case, now we have these two going in a positive direction. So that's a plus two N, right? And this is a plus four N. So when I add them together, guys, I'm gonna get six Newtons. And then in this case, we have a six Newton coming right to, towards the right and we have this coming towards the right as well. So that's a total of 12 Newtons. Remember, arrows, we pick a direction as positive and in the opposite direction where the arrows go in the opposite direction as negative. So in this case, because they're both going towards the right, we just assign them a positive value, okay? So what we're doing is we're adding these two. And so when we add them, we end up with 12 Newtons. Now among these four guys, they want us to select the greatest one. Right, and the greatest one is gonna be A. This 13 is greater than the 12, is greater than six, is greater than zero. So our answer is A, right? So A is our answer for question two. So moving along to question three. Question three is asking us which of the following is a non-renewable energy resource. So what we can't get more of. When we use it up and we're done, we're done, right? Biomass is renewable because that, that's just from the breakdown of human, you know, like plants and animals, just biological sources. So that's always going to be um, renewable. So that's not this one um, because that's renewable. Wind is also renewable. So this is not our answer. Natural gas, guys, once we use up all our natural gas, we are done. It's non-renewable. We can't renew it. So right away, we know that this is what it is. It's natural gas, right? And of course, sun 
we know that sun is renewable. So that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for non-renewable non and that's natural gas, right? So our answer for three is C. All right. So moving along to four now, question four. Item four refers to the lamps below. So you see we have these lamps here. They're structured in different ways. The lamp shade itself has a different shape in each case. The base of the lamp is different in each case, right? So they're asking us which one of these lamps are going to be the most stable lamp. Which one is going to be most stable, right? So now we have to think back to our section on stability and equilibrium, right? And when we think back to that section of our syllabus about stability and equilibrium, we remember that the, the, the object that will be most stable is one that has a low center of gravity, right? If it has a wide base, it will be stable right, for the most part, and if the weight of the object, this kind of varies depending on what's going on there, but the key things that we want to look at as it relates to these lamps that are shown here, these four lamps, is like, which one has the lowest center of gravity, and which one has the widest base, and that one will be our most stable lamp, and it turns out that in this particular case, that's A, right, so look at this wide base, very wide base compared to all the others, Right, and so the center of gravity is also going to be fairly low, right, around somewhere here. And so when we compare this lamp to all the other lamps, given our criteria for stability, so these that I've written here are our criteria for stability, right, we see that A matches those criteria the best, okay? All right, so these are our criteria for stability that I've written here. So let's make sure that you remember, brush up on this concept of stability, okay? So here our answer would be A. So P, lamp P, is going to be our most stable lamp. So moving down to question five now. Question five says, which of the following is most, most suitable, right? So the most suitable one for measuring the diameter of a wire. So we have a wire, a teeny tiny wire like this, right? And we're trying to measure the diameter of that wire. That's a very small, right? A very small um, measurement that we want to make. So a metric rule is not going to work, right? If you have a teeny thing like a wire and you want to measure its diameter, this is far too big to give you an accurate measurement. So we're not going to use a metric ruler. We can't use a tape measure. That's not going to be accurate enough. Now we get into the ones that might actually work. So now we have to choose between the vernier calipers and the micrometer screw gauge, right? No. For the vernier caliper, that's when we want to measure things with like a length of like one centimeter to 10 centimeters, right? And that's that's too big for, for a wire, for a diameter of a wire. Diameters of a wire is more in the order of less than one centimeters. And that's what micrometer screw gauges measure very accurately. Remember, they said they want us to choose the most suitable one. So micrometer screw gauge is going to give us a very accurate value of the diameter of our very thin wire, okay? So the answer in this case is D, All right? So just, just make a note how we eliminate these ones. These are too big to measure a tiny diameter of a wire and the vernier caliper also is gonna be, you know, too, 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 too big of a measurement for what we want. So it's not gonna be as accurate as a micrometer screw gauge would be since that's on the order of less than one centimeter. So we just choose D, okay? So five is D, that's best suited for what we want. Um, question six says, which of the following is the correct SI unit for pressure, right? So pressure, it's not going to be joule, absolutely not, because that's work, right, or energy. Pascal is what we're looking for. Pascal is the SI unit of pressure, and that Pascal can also be written as what, guys? Newton per meter squared, right? These are equivalent units. Pascal and Newton meter per Newton per meter squared. But the answer here is B, it's Pascal. Okay. All right. So that's six B. All right. Moving down to seven now. Seven says that a vehicle with a uniform velocity, right? Uniform velocity, velocity is what displacement over time, right? So it means that this displacement over time is a steady one, right? It is a constant one. So um, the velocity is 10, so that's positive. That's a positive velocity that we have here for that vehicle. 
and they're asking us which of the following um displacement time graphs so they're all xt graphs displacement time graphs displacement which one of them is going to represent a, a car moving with uniform velocity right so what we're looking for then guys given this formula for velocity we know that velocity is equal to the displacement over time and in this case they're using x for displacement so let's do that it's x over time that's our velocity right so if it's a uniform velocity it means that our x over t or our gradient right has to be constant right and it has to be positive since our uniform velocity is positive so when we look at this very first graph we actually see that it's this one right so if we look here we see that our gradient right so the gradient of this curve would actually be um a constant positive one right it's going up like this and it's constant right constant going going up like that so it's a positive gradient right and that's what we that's what we expect for this kind of a scenario we have a uniform velocity of 10 meters per second and then in the case of b there's no gradient so that's not gonna work right that doesn't represent a uniform velocity that represents a velocity of zero pretty much right because that's x over t is not changing so we know that that's a zero gradient and that's not what we want and then in this case it's a constant negative gradient because it's going down like this that's not what we want because that would indicate that it has a negative uniform velocity and we know it's positive from here and then in this case the gradient is too steep right so that's not changing at a constant rate and that's what we need to see for our constant or uniform velocity Right, so again, we go back to our very first option, which was A, so A is our answer here. Again, we're looking for a positive, constant positive gradient, and that's what this represents for us, okay? All right, so for question A now, which of the following is not a vector, right? So if something is not a vector, what we're looking for is um what's a scalar? So we're looking for a scalar, and one that just it only has magnitude and no direction, right? So that's what we're looking for in this question. We're looking for a scalar quantity, right? So let's look at these. Mass is the one. Mass is only magnitude. Mass doesn't have direction. So A is our answer here for A, right? Right away, we get the right answer. Force is a vector because we know that force is equal to mass times acceleration, and acceleration is a vector. Velocity is a vector because it has a direction associated with it. So it's not this. It's not this. And acceleration is a vector because it, it's, it's velocity in a specified direction, right? So this is not it. So the only one here that's not a vector is the mass, right? It's a scalar. So our answer is A. So moving down to question nine. Question nine says that force is directly proportional to... So immediately, before we even look down here, we can be like, okay, what is force, right? How do we calculate force? Or we think of um, Newton's second law of motion, and that's just that F is equal to MA, right? So that means that the force is proportional to the acceleration. So we're going to look here for acceleration, and we see that that is B, and so B is our answer, right? So force, remember, force is going to depend on the acceleration. How is that velocity changing over time? That's what acceleration is, and that's what gives us a force, right? So force is directly proportional to acceleration. So we look here for acceleration, and we get B. We are good, right? Moving down to question 10. So question 10 tells us that there's a cyclist, and he's riding down a hill, right? And then when he applies his brakes and then finally comes to rest at the bottom of the hill, which of the following energy changes takes place, right? So look at my little diagram that I draw here. It's always good to just draw a picture of what's going on so you can see all the things, right? So we have a cyclist. He's at the top of a hill, right? And then he's going to be moving with a velocity down the hill. He gets to the bottom of the hill. He's going to step on his brakes and come to rest, right? So when the cyclist is at the top of the hill, he has potential energy, right? Because he's at a certain height above the ground. So there's some potential energy that he has up, up here. So I'm going to just say he has potential energy while he's up there at the top of the hill. And of course, now once he moves off, he moves up with a velocity, 
right? And that velocity is associated with a kinetic energy, movement energy, right? So we're going from our potential energy, then we're going to kinetic energy. And then finally, when it comes to our rest and presses that break, there's going to be some heat energy given off, right? So we're going like this, guys. We're going from potential energy to kinetic energy, then, then heat is going to be given off once it comes to rest, right? And so we're going to look for what, what option matches that transition, those energy changes from potential to kinetic to heat. So when we look through our answers, we see that A only stops at kinetic, and that's not right, because once he comes to rest, there is heat, and he does come to rest, so he doesn't stop at kinetic, right? So he goes ponetic, potential to kinetic to heat, so this is our answer. This is what we're looking for, right? Remember now, start to potential at the top of the hill, converts that to kinetic, so he gets some movement, and then he comes to rest, and then once he draws those breaks, heat's going to be given off, so B is our answer for 10, okay? And so with that now, let's move on to question 11. Question 11 is this one, and it's asking us to define acceleration. Acceleration can be defined as the rate of change of velocity, right? So our answer is A. So remember this formula for acceleration is your final velocity minus your initial velocity over time, right? So it's the rate at which the velocity changes. So that's our answer for A, for 11. It's A, right? All right. So that's 11A. So moving down to 12, 12 says, which of the following does the pressure of a fluid depend upon, right? So remember now, if we have the pressure, pressure of a fluid. So say I'm at a point, say I'm at this point P, right? And I have like the surface of my liquid is up here. And I am down here, so I am at point P. There's a distance between me and the surface of the liquid, that's H, right? Um, also, the liquid itself that I'm in has a certain density, right? So say that density is rho, right? So the pressure that I feel at this point, right, in that fluid is going to depend on the density of the liquid that I'm in, as well as the distance from the surface, right? So it's come up with P, the pressure being proportional to density of the liquid that I'm in, and the pressure is also going to be proportional to the height, right? Now, remember, the formula is actually P is equal to H rho G, right? But the G that's in this formula is actually a constant, right? That's a constant of proportionality. Remember, gravity doesn't change, right? So when we go down here and we're choosing what the pressure actually depends on, Yes, it depends on the depth. We just established that, right, per this diagram. It depends on the depth of the fluid. It depends on the density of the fluid that I am in, right? So that's this one. But in the acceleration due to gravity, no, it doesn't depend on this, guys. This is a constant of proportionality that comes from this dependence, right? So this is a constant of proportionality. So it doesn't depend, the pressure doesn't depend on this. The pressure depends on depth and density. So that's one and two only. And so that's C, our answer is C, right? So just remember that pressure depends on the, the height or the depth as well as the density of the fluid. Okay, so moving along. So our answer for 12 is C. Um, so moving right along to 13, we're talking about the period of a simple pendulum. Right, and this is an experiment that you guys um would have done perhaps for your SBA. And so what you were varying was the length of the string, right? And so when you vary the length of the string, you see that the period changes. And so the period is dependent on the length of the string, right? So that's our answer here. Um, so that's thirteen. The answer is A. So question fourteen. Now we have an airplane. That's traveling at constant speed, right? So that's constant speed at an altitude of a thousand meters above sea level. Which of the following is true? So before we even look at what they're asking us, I like to draw a picture of what's going on, right? So here's my airplane and my airplane is traveling at a constant speed. So it's like going in this direction. So it's a constant speed, right? And it's above sea level by a thousand meters. So Right, so we know that there's like some potential energy at play here because it's all the way up here from the ground. So there's a H here and we know that potential energy. So PE, 
is equal to what? MGH, right? So the air plane has a mass. It's above, it's at a certain height above the ground and there's acceleration due to gravity at play. So, you know, the plane has some potential energy and it also has kinetic energy because it's moving in a certain direction, right? So KE is equal to half MV squared. So that plane has both potential and kinetic energy. So let's come down here and see what they're asking us. What is true about the plane? The kinetic energy is increasing? Nope, that's not true. And why isn't that true? Because this is a constant speed, right? The speed isn't changing. And so if the speed isn't changing, the kinetic energy is not going to change, right? So the kinetic energy is not increasing. So that's not true. Kinetic energy only, it only has kinetic energy. That's not true either because it's above sea level. It has a height associated with it. So it has a potential energy. So this is not true. So C says it has potential energy only. That's not true either because it's moving, right? It's moving, but although at a constant speed, it still has motion. And so whenever a body has motion, it, it, it has kinetic energy. So it's not only potential energy that it has, it has kinetic energy as well. So our final thing here is that it has both potential and kinetic energy, and that's true, right? Refer back to our diagram. The plane is moving, it has motion, and it's a certain height above the ground, so it has both potential and kinetic energy. So our answer for 14 is going to be D, okay? All right. So moving down to question 15. Question 15 says, which of the following is true about a body in equilibrium? So what's true about a body in equilibrium? One, they're asking if the sum of the forces in one direction is equal to the sum of the forces in the opposite direction. Will a body be in equilibrium in that case? Yes, that's true. The sum of the forces is equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise forces. No, that's not true. That's not the wording that we use, right? It's not that the sum of the forces is equal to the sum of anti-clockwise forces. So that's false. That's not true, right? That's not required. a requirement for equilibrium. What's a requirement for equilibrium is this one, right? Which says that the sum of the clockwise moments, the moments, right? The sum of the clockwise moments, right? So the moments, that's that F times D, right? The sum of the clockwise one, right? It's supposed to be equal to the sum of the anti-clockwise one. So moments, and that's true. So that's a true statement, right? So of these, the true ones are one and three. So our answer here is C, which is one and three, okay? So really and truly, what they're trying to do is throw you off here, right? Because you might say like, oh yeah, some are clockwise, some are anti-clockwise, but you have to know some of what? in the clockwise direction. Not sum of forces, guys. Sum of moments in the clockwise is equal to the sum of the moments in the anticlockwise. So that's how we ended up with three and one. And so we selected C for number 15, okay? All right. So moving down to question 16. So question 16 says that we have 400 kilograms, so that's a mass, right? of methylated spirit occupying a volume of 0 0.5 meters cubed. So that's a volume, right? So we have a mass and we have a volume and they're asking us to calculate density, right? The formula for density, guys, is mass divided by volume. And so we do 400 kilograms divided by 0 0.5 meter cube. And we end up with A times 10 to the second kilogram per meter cube, right? So that is A. So our answer is A. So all we're doing for 16 is applying this formula for density, which says that mass divided by volume is our density. When we do that, we come out with A for our answer. So the answer for 16 is A. All right. So 17 now is saying, what is the gain in gravitational potential energy of a body of weight 200 newtons, right? So this is weight which is the same as what? Force, right? Times gravity, all right? So this is our weight. It's a force times acceleration due to gravity. So it's the same, right? Fa, so that's our weight there. Um, So the body has a weight of this, 2,000 newtons. So that is equal to 2,000 newtons, that weight, right? And, um. Well, so the weight is what? It's actually mass times gravity. Mass times gravity, and so we get that, right? So 
So the weight is equal to the mass of that body times acceleration or gravity. Acceleration is gravity. And so that weight that they gave us was 2,000 newtons. And they're saying that it rises from a height of 20 to 25. So the change in height is what we're concerned about when we talk about potential energy. So the change in height is 25 minus 20. So that change in height will be five meters, right? And so our formula for, for, for potential, right, energy is MGH, right? And we know MG, that's just, just our weight, right? And they told us that that was 2000 in the question. And so we calculated our delta H or our change in height, right? That it rises from, it's rising from 20 to 25, so that's five. So we just multiply our weight by five, or that's our delta H, right? So delta H, and we end up getting 10,000 joules. So that's C, or so our answer is C. Okay, so here all we're doing is we're applying the formula for gravitational potential energy, which is can either be mg delta H or the weight times delta H, right? And so that's what we did here, 2,000 times five, which is our delta H, and we came up with 10,000, so our answer is C. Right. All right. So question 18 says, when a liquid in a puddle evaporates, there's this keyword here, when a liquid in a puddle evaporates, its temperature changes, right? So when you have evaporation, the liquid, the liquid temperature changes, right? How does the temperature, but how does it change, right? How does the temperature of the liquid change and why? So we have to think about what's happening when, when there's evaporation, right? So evaporation is what they call a surface phenomenon, right? So that means that if you have your liquid, so say I have my liquid in a in a container here, right? So I have my liquid here. Evaporation is going to take place at the surface. So evaporation is going to take place at the surface here when um the liquid, the particles that are at the surface of the liquid have enough energy to escape. So they, they run away. They escape and they enter the vapor phase. Right, they have that vapor phase, they escape and they leave, they enter the vapor phase, and so there's some liquid that's remaining down here. Right, so because it's the ones that have the higher, the higher energy are gonna escape, that means that the, the, the liquid itself is losing energy, right? And that loss in energy is because the, the, the particles that have the most energy are leaving and they're taking the energy with them. So there's less energy remaining in the liquid and that's manifested as a temperature drop, right? So our temperature is actually going to decrease, not increase, so we can rule out C and D. Our temperature is going to decrease, but why does it decrease? As we said, the temperature decrease. So we're going to say the temperature decrease of the liquid, the temperature of the liquid decrease because the particles at the surface that have the all the energy are gonna escape and go into the vapor phase and leave the liquid with just a little about little bit of energy. And so the temperature is gonna drop, right? Low, low energy, low temperature, right? So this is the reason. So our answer is B here, right? So the reason is that um the more energetic molecules are gonna leave the liquid and enter the vapor phase. And so when they do that, the temperature of the liquid is gonna drop because the liquid doesn't have any energy remaining because these ones at the surface took it all and went away, okay? So this is our answer, 18 is B, okay? All right, so moving down to 19 now. 19 is asking us which scientist successfully show the relationship between heat and mechanical work, right? So when we talk about work or heat, we're normally talking about a joule, right? We measure those in joules. And so our guy is gonna be joule. Joule is the guy who did all these um, experiments to show this relationship between heat and mechanical work, right? Einstein, that wasn't really his thing, right? That wasn't his thing. Rumford, that wasn't his thing. He was more of an atomic physicist. And what is a power guy, right? What is a rate of work? So, so he's a power guy. He's an atomic physics guy. Einstein is also an atomic physics guy, right? With, with um, the relativity equation and stuff like that. But the guy who is responsible for work and heat energy and showing those interactions is Joule. So our answer for 19 is A, that's Joule, okay? All right, so going down to question 20 now. 
Question 20 says that a thermostat used in a domestic iron is made from a bimetallic strip. So there are two metals in this strip. It's a bimetallic strip. It's comprising of um, a strip of iron and a strip of brass. And that's shown below, right? So they show you the brass. The brass is this white section of the strip. And then the iron is this gray section of the strip. So the question continues. It says that the strip is heated and the brass expands more than the iron, right? So if the brass, if this white part expands more than the iron, then the metal that expands more is going to end up being on the outer side of the curve, right? So whenever we look at the curves that are associated with the shape, the possible shapes that you can get, the wide part has to be on the outside of the curve, not the inside part. So in this case, the wide part is in like in the middle of this curve. So it can be this one, right? Remember the wide part is for brass and that expands more. And the one that expands more is gonna be on the outside. So we see that in this one, right? The brass is on the outside of that curve, the outer part of that curve. And the iron is on the inside. And that's what we expect because the brass expands more than the iron. So the brass is going to be on the outer part of the curve. So our answer here is going to be B. Right? These ones don't really capture what happens to the bimetallic strip. In this case, it, it's showing that nothing really happened. And that can't be the case because they told us that it expands when it's heat. And in this one, this curvy, curvy thing, no, that's not what we're going to get. That's like kind of like an S curve. No. So this one isn't even an option. It was between these two from the get-go. And in the end, B was our answer because B shows the brass being on the outer side and the one that expands more is going to be on the outer side, right? So B is our answer for 20. All right, so, 20, 20, so 21, the name given to the amount of energy that's needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of iron by one Kelvin, right? So we talk about raising temperature, of a one kilogram mass by one Kelvin, we're talking about the specific heat capacity. So this is our answer. It's specific heat capacity and not heat capacity because it's for a specific mass, one kilogram, right? And it's for a specific temperature. So if we were to rearrange the E is equal to MC delta T, which is the formula when we're measuring um heat changes, right? Um. The, the C or specific heat capacity is equal to energy over M delta T. So the energy required to raise the mass of one kilogram of iron by one Kelvin is going to be our specific heat capacity. It's not latent heat because that doesn't have to do with temperature change or temperature rising. It's not heat capacity because we have a specific mass, so it needs to be specific. It's not specific latent heat because it wasn't latent heat to begin with. So it can only be specific heat capacity. So our answer is D. Okay. All right. So 20, 22 now says that Sharon painted half the roof of her dog house white and the other half black. She noticed that the half painted black, right? So she, she noticed that when she painted black, that side dry much quicker than the, than the half that's painted white, right? The property that best explains why the half paint, the half painted black dried quicker, is that dark bodies, right, are better. Are they better insulators? No. Are dark bodies better heat absorbers? Yes, right? If something is dark or black, it's going to absorb a lot more heat, a lot more radiation. And so because they're better heat absorbers, then it's going to dry quicker, right? Because you need the heat to dry the paint, right? And so if the black part is a better heat absorber, it's going to dry faster, right? So the property that best explains why the half painted black dried quicker is that dark bodies are better absorbers of heat. So black bodies aren't better at reflecting heat and they're not better at conducting heat. They're better at absorbing so this is our answer. So 22 is B. Okay. So 23 now says that bubbles of gas rising from a scuba diver below the surface of the sea increases in size as they rise to the surface, right? So here's my little diagram here. I love to draw diagrams just to see what's going on, right? 
So let's look at this. They're saying that we have a scuba diver. I've shown him there in that blue dot. So this is our scuba diver, right? He's at a certain height below the water and there are bubbles rising up, right? There are bubbles rising up. And as they come up to the surface, the bubbles are going to increase in their size. So if we started with it being this teeny tiny one, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as we come up to the surface here, right? And so you might remember they're asking, why does the size increase, right? Why does the size of the bubbles increase? Down here, it's teeny tiny. Up here, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it approaches the surface, right? So when the scuba diver is down here, those bubbles rising, right? There's a higher um, amount of pressure on it because of its depth in the fluid, right? So that pressure is going to make those particles compress. They're going to have a smaller size. Whereas as they go up, they're going to be able to, they're going to have less pressure on them so they can expand more. And so their size will increase, right? So let's look for something that reflects that. Water pressure on the bubbles decreases. Water pressure on the bubbles increases. Why did their size increase? Their size increased because the water pressure on the bubbles decreased because we're going up. So the water pressure decreases. And so our answer for this one is A, right? The water pressure on the bubbles doesn't increase as he goes up to the surface because the H is decreasing. So this can be right. Atmospheric pressure on the bubble decreases. No, atmospheric pressure is just what it is. It's not changing, right? It's out here that we would have the atmospheric pressure. And that's not changing. It's just what it is. It's not decreasing or it's not increasing. So it can't be any of these three. It would have to be A, that the water pressure on the bubble decreased because the point, the H is getting smaller as you go up, right? All right, and remember this formula now that we said pressure is equal to um, the density, right, times the height times the gravity. And so if our H is getting smaller as we go up to the surface, that means that the pressure that the bubbles feel is also getting smaller. So this is our answer, okay? 23 is A. All right, so moving down to 24. 24 says that the clinical thermometer is designed so that it is very sensitive, right? We want our clinical thermometer that, they, that they're taking our temperatures with as we go to the doctor. We want that to be very sensitive to so very small changes in temperature so that the doctor can get an accurate read as to what's going on with us, okay? So it needs to be very sensitive. So we look at this figure, we see we, or we have our glass bulb and we have our, our bore here that's in the middle, right? And so for this to be very sensitive, we need we need the we need the glass bulb to be thin and we need the bore to be narrow. And the reason why we need those guys, we need those those parameters to be that way, is because um the bulb holds the mercury. And so we want the bulb to be as thin as possible so that heat can be easily transferred through. We want it to have a thin wall, right? And we want so we want this to be a thin wall so that we can have rapid heat conduction, right? So that we can measure any little changes in temperature. Remember, we want to be very sensitive, right? So we need it to be thin-walled, the glass bulb to be thin-walled, right? And then as it relates to the bore, now we want the bore to be narrow. And the reason why we want the bore to be narrow is that when there's any changes in the in the volume in the in the volume of the mercury, because remember now, you know, the bore is what is what's holding the mercury, right? So whenever there's any changes in volume, it can be measured very rapidly. So we have a narrow bore, it's gonna measure changes, right? In volume of mercury, mercury, um, very in a very noticeable way if it's narrow we're gonna see those changes in a very noticeable way if it was like big and wide we wouldn't really see the changes and we want to be able to see right so the narrow bore enables us to measure changes in the volume of the mercury in a very noticeable way and we need that if we want high sensitivity and we also need the glass tube to be thin walled so that there can be rapid heat conduction right through the wall right and so which of the following features should it have? Should it be thick wall with a wide bore? No. Should it be thin wall with a wide bore? No. Should it be thin walled with a narrow bore? Yes, that's what we want. We want it to be like that for the very reasons I outlined up here, right? 
And so Caesar answer, thick walled and narrow bore. No, that's not going to work. We need both a thin walled and a narrow bore. Okay, a thin walled bulb and a narrow bore in our clinical thermometer for maximum sensitivity. Okay, so moving down to question 25. Question 25 says, in a YouTube video, Mr. Lee and his students heat a metal drum. And then the, after they heat the metal drum, so let me draw the metal drum. After they applied some fire to it. Oops. Nope, not that. <laughs> after they applied some fire to it now. So here's our flame under this metal drum. After they heat it up, then they cap it. So they cap it like this. They put a cap on it, right? So essentially what you're having that, maybe you can imagine you have some hot, gas molecules or some hot particles that are in that drum and they're trapped in that drum right then after they do that now mr lee and his students they take the drum and they dump it in cold water so here we have a tub of cold water right and he's gonna dump the drum the closed drum the sealed drum in here right when he does that the video shows that the drum like this drum that said this drum had a volume v right well, you know, the volume is the whole thing and not like a, a, a length. So it's a whole volume of it. So let's say the whole volume of it was V. That's going to get crushed, right? So the volume is essentially going to decrease, right? So they're asking us the gas law that best explains the observation. What the observation is that it got crushed once it was dunked in the cold water. Which gas law best describes that? So again, think of what variables we have at play here, right? He's obviously changing the temperature because we're going from a hot vessel to cold water. So we know that T changes, right? T changes, as I've written over here, temperature changes, right? As he goes from the heated metal drum and dunks that into a cold water. The temperature is going to change. But the pressure is going to remain constant because he sealed off the tube, right? He sealed off the drum. So the pressure that was in there is going to just be constant. Um, the temperature is changing. So if we have temperature changing and pressure constant, that's Charles' law. So our volume is going to be proportional to the temperature change. And so that's Charles' law. So the gas law that explains... <coughs> Sorry. The gas law... That explains what happened is going to be Charles' law because we have a volume that's changing with temperature, right? So that's Charles' law. So remember, temperature is changing because it's changing from heat to cold water, and then the pressure is constant because they seal the tube. So that's Charles' law, okay? Okay, so B is our answer for 25. So going down to 26, 26 says that an electronic air conditioner maintains the temperature of the inside of an office building at 24 degrees C. So this is what they want in the office. They want their office to be cool and to be at around 24 degrees C, right? So which of the following measures could noticeably reduce the electricity bill? So guys, if we're trying to reduce our electricity bill, we're trying to use as, as, as the least amount of energy as possible in our AC unit, right? So least, we need to use the least amount of energy possible if we want our bill to decrease, right? So least amount of energy. So let's choose, let's choose the measures that would end up with us using the least amount of energy for the AC unit, right? For the AC, for the air conditioner unit. So let's look down here now and see. If we reduce the temperature to 21 degrees C, we're making the room cooler, right? It's cooler than the 24 that it's typically at. So if we're making the room cooler by reducing the temperature to 21 degrees C, we're going to need more energy to do that. So we don't want to do that if we're trying to reduce our bill. We don't want to do that, right? We don't want to reduce the temperature because that's going to require more energy from the AC unit to do that, right? But can we hang curtains at the window? Yeah, we can hang curtains at the window because that will kind of keep off some of the heat from coming in, right? So this is a good move if you want to lower our energy bill. And then now, we could also paint the roof of the building with aluminum paint. Could we? Yeah, we could do that. We could do that. We could paint the roof of the building with aluminum paint. And the reason why is that that aluminum is going to be a reflector of radiation. It's a very good reflector. 
right? So it's not going to absorb the heat from the sun coming in. It's going to reflect off the heat of the sun. And so the, the net effect is that our office will be cool. We'll be keeping it cooler for little or nothing, right? We're not, that's not going to cost us. Or that's not going to increase our energy bill. So these two are good measures, right? So two and three are very good measures. So let's choose C here for our answer. Two and three is going to help us to lower our energy bill. So 26, the answer is C. Okay. So moving on to question 28 now. Item 28 refers to the following table. So we have a table where we have pressure in kilopascals and we have our volume in centimeter cube, right? And we see that at a pressure of one kilopascals, we have a volume of 40, right? CM cube. And then we see that when we increase the pressure to 1.3, our volume actually what? Decreases, right? So the volume decrease. So look at this now. So if we increase pressure, the volume decreases. So that's Boyle's law. That's at play, right? So they're telling us that the table shows two pairs of reading taken from an experiment to investigate Boyle's law. Which of the following values below is most likely to be measured um, pressure, to be the measured pressure if the volume is reduced to 20 cm cube, right? So we can just pick any pair of the any pair of the readings here. And because it's Boyle's law that we're investigating, we're going to do P is proportional to 1 over V, inversely proportional to 1 over V, right? So if the pressure increase, the volume decrease, and so that's this relationship. So we can use P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And so our P1, let's select, let's use this point as our point one, as our first one. So we're going to use P1, V1 from that data set. So the P here is one kilopascal and the volume is 40 cm cube. So we just put those here for our P1, V1. And then P2, V2 now, we're trying to find pressure, right? So P, so we made that pressure X or unknown. And then the volume, of course, is when the volume is 20 that they're asking us to calculate it. So we put 20 here. Sulfur X, so we end up doing 40 divided by 20, right? So we bring the 20 over. So we do 40 times 1 divided by 20 we're going to come out with two kilopascals. So we look for that answer here. And the closest one to that is, is 1.9 kilopascals. So our answer here is C. All right. so all we're doing is applying Boyle's law to find our unknown or a new pressure once we um, drop the volume to 20. Okay, so we just use P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2, and we're good. We come out with two, which is pretty much just C. Right, so the answer for 28 is C. Okay, so for 29 now, whoo, I skipped 27, guys. I skipped 27. Let's do 27. I skipped, I somehow jumped over 27. So let's do 27 and then we come back over here. So 27, item 27 refers to the diagram below. So these are our diagrams here. We have P, Q, R, and S. And they're saying that in the diagram above, P, Q, R, and S are identical containers. So they're identical containers, mean that their volume is, everything about them is identical. Um, they're containing water. So all of them have in water, but in for P, the mass is M, and in Q, the mass is 2M, the mass of water is 2M. And then in R, the mass of water is 3M, and then in S, it's 4M, right? And they're all at different temperatures. This one is at 80 degrees C, this one is at 60, this one is at 40, this one is at 20, right? So they're asking which of the following must lose the most energy to cool down to 10 degrees C, right? Which one of them has to lose the most energy? So we can do that because there's a temperature drop associated with it. We can use our E is equal to MC delta T formula, right? That's for specific heat capacity. We can use this and because they're all water, the C will be constant, right? So we don't have to worry about that. What we actually have to take into account then is the that the energy then is going to be proportional to the mass of the water, because you see they all have different mass, and it's going to be proportional to the delta T, the change in temperature that's gonna we're gonna incur to go from 80 to T to, to 10, from 60 to 10, 40 down to 10, 20 down to 10. They're saying which of the following 
which of these containers or these setups must lose the most energy, right, to cool down? So again, we said the energy is going to be dependent on the mass and the delta T. So the mass in the first case is M, right? And we're going from 80 to 10. So that's a temperature drop of 70. So that's 70 M, right? That's the amount of energy that would be lost in this case. It would be 70 M, right? And then in this case, we're, we have a mass of 2 M, and we're going from 60 down to 10, so that's 50. So that's 2m times 50 from our E is equal to m delta T, guys. So this is going to be what? 100m. That's how much energy this one will have to lose. And then this one will have to lose the mass, 3m, right, times the temperature delta T, which is 40 minus 10, so that's 30. So that would be what, 90 M's. That's how much energy this one will have to lose to cool down to 10. And this one is 4 M, that's the mass of it. And it will have to go from 20 down to 10. So that's 4 M times 10. So that would be what, that would give us 40 M. That's how much it has to lose. So if we look at all of these, which one has to lose the most? It's this one. Q has to lose a 100 M's to go down from 60 to 10. So the answer here is Q. So we look for Q and select that option and that's B, right? Answer B is correlated with Q, which would need to lose the most energy in order to come down from 60 to 10, right? So answer for 27 is B, right? Okay, so let's go back to 29 now because we had jumped over this to, to this. So let's come to 29 now. So 29, yeah. Lightning is seen several seconds before thunder is heard. Like, why do we see lightning? And then shortly after, we'll hear the thunder roll, right? So lightning strike, and then shortly after, we hear the thunder. The reason why this happens is because, is it because thunder is produced after lightning? No, that's not true. Thunder isn't produced after lightning. Um, Light can pass through a vacuum and sound cannot. I mean... This is true. Light can pass through vacuum and sound cannot, but that's not why we see the lightning first. So this is not the reason why, but this is a true statement. It just doesn't apply to what we're seeing here, right? What's actually true is that the speed of light is much faster than the speed of sound, right? So because the light travels faster than the sound, we're going to see the lightning before we hear the sound. So that's this is this is the answer here. So the answer is C. That's our answer. Um, this is not true. This is not true. Um, so C is our answer, right? So C is the answer for 29. And then for 30 now, 30 says that the list of electromagnetic waves, we were supposed to list them in order of decreasing wavelength, right? So we're gonna start from our longest wavelength to our shortest wavelength. So of all of these that are here, let's look at all the rays that are listed. We have X-rays, UV, infrared, and microwaves. The longest wavelength is going to be microwaves. So we, got, we have to select an answer that starts with microwaves because of these four shown, microwaves have the longest wavelength. So we have to start there and then continue our list. So that eliminates A and B, right? Because remember, our list is in order of decreasing wavelength. So we're starting from the longest and ending with the shortest. So it can be that we're starting with any of these. Um, so the answer is between C and D, right? All right, so we started with microwaves. After microwaves, what's the next? What's the shorter wavelength after microwaves? After microwaves, we're gonna have infrared, right? If we remember our spectrum, after microwaves, we're gonna have infrared. And then after infrared, we're gonna have UV, Right, and then after UV, then in, in what's given here, it would be X-rays. And we know that X-rays are very short. They have a short lambda, right? And they have a high frequency, right? So just remember that, that that's the ordering of it there. X-rays are very short wavelength. Microwaves are very long wavelength. Um, and so that this is the order that we want. Microwaves, then infrared, then UV, then X-rays. So our answer for 30 is D. Right, so just remember that this is the order. Microwaves and UV, then we have ultraviolet, then we have X-ray, right? Of course, they're missing some of them in, in between, but 
to be specific to this question, we're using the rays that they gave us, right? The waves that they gave us and of the waves that they gave us, microwave is the longest wavelength, x-rays are the shortest. So our answer is D. Okay. All right. So our answer is D for 30. And that's it for this section. We'll, we'll come back with the remaining 30. Okay. So make sure that you like this video. Make sure that you subscribe. Make sure that you comment down below to let me know if it was good for you. And then, yeah, hopefully we'll see you in the next one.